Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We thank you and praise you for this day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that you have made. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We get to be here. We get to hear the word that you've prepared, Lord. Help it to come forth in its fullness. I prophesy ears to hear, hearts to receive, and minds to be open to what you have in store for us today, Lord. And I thank you and praise you, Lord. You are worthy. You are awesome. You are wonderful. You are magnificent. You are beautiful. You are perfect. We love you. We serve you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> the title of my message is, What You Don't Know Can Hurt You. Amen and hallelujah over here. <laughs> what you don't know can hurt you. Hallelujah. If there's ever been a time in history to have God's wisdom and Holy Spirit discernment, it's right now. It's today. We're living in a time when there is so much information flying at us. It's on a continual basis. So many opinions, so many different narratives, so much information and division among people and even religious communities about what's true, what's right, what's good, what's bad. We're under siege. Feels like that, doesn't it? I've heard it called an information war. There's disinformation. There's misinformation. There's propaganda. There's false narratives, evil doctrines, and they're coming from so many different sources. We're, we are privy to so many resources of information, more so than ever in history. We've got media, and that includes social, which is a big one. I think a lot of people get their news from social media, uh, which you know is fa Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. We get it from newspapers, there's magazines. You can't go to a grocery store and not see a headline, right? It's right there. There's new news, the old fashioned news broadcasting stations, you know, CBS, NBC, CNN. There's the internet. Hollywood is in our face. At the water cooler. And last night, I yeah. Even with all of that, last night I heard somebody, Jeremy was listening to a program and, and somebody said something, I don't even know who it was, said that we are probably less informed about the truth than ever. Even though we have all this information, we're less informed. People are less informed. But God. It definitely feels like a battle, doesn't it? And we can't survive this spiritual war without discernment holy spirit discernment because it is a spiritual battle it is between good and bad and it absolutely is a battle for the hearts and minds of people spiritual discernment in its simplest definition is the ability through the holy spirit's empowerment to decide between truth and error right and wrong good and bad Another definition says that it is a gift of the Holy Spirit as a way of having insight into determining the true nature of a situation, person, or thing. It's seeing the world and ourselves through God's eyes. To recognize if something is genuine or authentic, discernment is to recognize if something is genuine or authentic after examination. It's the ability to think biblically about all areas of life. It's indispensable and it's, a, it's an uncompromising. It's if, sorry, I'll say that again. I stumbled on my words. It is indispensable to an uncompromising life. Discernment. It's indispensable. I can't say that word for some reason every time I say it. Even as I study for today's message, and this happens just about every time I study, I'll study a scripture 
and I'll just want a little bit maybe more insight into it. I'll go and research it a little bit. I'll go online and other sources and I'll find several different, several different ideas or opinions about what it means. Sometimes the difference is really subtle and I absolutely need the Holy Spirit to help me discern what God is saying in Scripture. Lord, what are you saying? I don't want my own opinion. I don't want somebody else's opinion. What are you saying about this scripture? Or what are you saying through this scripture? Knowing and understanding scripture is a key weapon to our survival in this information war. We need to be armed with it daily. Let's look at 2 Timothy 2, 15. Second Timothy two fifteen. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In the helps there it says, Paul likens the word of truth to a road being built or a furrow being plowed both of which must be straight. The good workman must be accurate and clear in his exposition of God's word, keeping to the road himself and making it easy for others to follow. Paul, as it says here in the helps, rightly dividing in Greek is ortho tomonta. And ortho means right or proper. That word makes sense to us as ortho, like orthodontis, makes our teeth straight, the straightening of our teeth. And tomonta means to cut. So this farming imagery that Paul shares here is a farmer seeks to cut a straight furrow as he plows a field. Getting, and he's getting ready to plant seed. Have you ever noticed how straight and like in unison rows of corn are? I mean, it's like perfection, really. <laughs> evenly spaced and perfectly aligned. When plowing a field, the farmer, back of course in Paul's days, looked at the end point on the other side of the field that he wanted to bring the line, the furrow to. And his, his um, gaze kept on that point the whole time that he was digging up the ground. Nowadays, there's a lot of equipment to help with that process, but in Paul's day, human skill is what the job needed. The only thing that was there to, to use. And they had to be very careful to do the job right if they wanted to produce a crop, which was literally life or death for them as their means of food and survival and livelihood. Likewise, the end goal for us in studying the Word of God is knowing the truth, growing in the knowledge and wisdom and discernment. And we must be open to hear His voice and what He shows us and not mix our own opinions, as I shared a minute ago, or anybody else's with it. Being of no opinion but his, a stranger's voice we don't want to follow. When asking the question, how do we get discernment? This is one of the most powerful tools in gaining healthy and true discernment, the word of God, which is absolute truth. Psalm 119, 160 says, the sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. In all of the information that we are getting daily through all kinds of sources, good and bad, if we have a good foundation in the Word of God, we will be well equipped with spiritual discernment of what is true, what is good, what is right, what is wrong. That second Timothy scripture that I just read says, be diligent. That is crucial. Now, more than ever, be diligent. I love the title of that Kingdom Dynamics that's right there in my Spirit-Filled Life Bible for 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, God's Word, read it, study it, memorize it, exclamation point. And it says, God's inspired word is the only <coughs> conclusive source of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding concerning ultimate realities. 
It is a fountainhead of free truth and a gold mine of practical principles, waiting to liberate and or enrich the person who will pursue its truth and wealth. Did you catch that? The word of God is waiting to liberate us. Hallelujah. Thus, Paul's instruction to be diligent, a worker, has been applied by serious Christians through centuries as a directive to study the word of God. The only way to healthy, balanced living is through the rightly dividing of God's word. Such correct, straight-on application of God's word is the result of diligent study. The text calls us beyond casual approaches to the scriptures, telling us to refuse to suit the Bible to our own convenience or ideology. In his earlier words, Paul also told Timothy, give attention to reading God's word, but now he emphasizing, emphasizes studying like a worker. Memorize the word as a mighty deterrent against sin. Memorizing the scripture also provides an immediate availability of God's words as a sword, ready in witnessing and effective in spiritual warfare. We need discernment. Hallelujah. Arm yourself with the word of God. We should be asking God probably almost on a continual basis. What does your word say about this topic, about this belief, about this idea, about this opinion, about this statement? All those things that we're hearing, all the information coming at us. Pastor Heidi shared a message last year, we need to have a biblical worldview. If we are to go through our days not falling prey to the lies and the deception, which is rampant and blatant at times, but also, it can be sneaky, tricky, and cunning. We must be armed with the truth. We have to stay in the word as a protection from the enemy who roams about, who he, who he may devour, he roams about seeking whom he may devour, sorry, with his lies. He comes looking and sounding good, and we absolutely need discernment to know what is good and what is evil. What is right? What is wrong? What is true? What is false? Scripture says that in the end days, even the very elect will be deceived. But not if you stay grounded in his word. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 13 through 17. I'm going to just turn the page over there. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. Doesn't that seem true right now? Evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I am going to read the Kingdom Dynamics there because it's so good. The absolute authority of the Bible over our lives is based on our conviction that this book does not merely contain the Word of God, but that it, it is the Word of God in its sum and in its parts. Hallelujah. That takes something on our part there, doesn't it, what that says there? Well, it's the absolute authority of, over our lives based on our own convictions that this book is the Word of God of God in its sum and in its parts. And Pastor Jeremy was just sharing about that this morning. He was talking about, you know, if some people believe that part of the Bible is just a fall fallacy or a parable or something not true. But if you believe that, then which parts are and which parts aren't? You have got to have it a settled issue in your heart. This is the absolute word of God. This is the absolute truth. 
No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This test, this text testifies of this, describing the actual process of this inspiration, which is in breathing of life. It is the word of the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of God. It literally means God breathed. This describes the source of the whole Bible's derivation. How, did I say that right? Derivation, derivation as transcendent of human inspiration. The Bible is not the product of elevated human consciousness or enlightened human intellect, but is directly breathed from God himself. It elaborates this truth and adds that none of what was given was merely the private opinion of the writer, and that each writer involved in the production of the Holy Scripture, Scriptures was moved by literally being born along the Holy Spirit. This does not mean that the writers were merely robots seized upon by God's power to write automatically without their conscious participation. God does not override those gifts of intellect and sensitivity that he has given his creatures. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 2, 10-13 expands on this process by which the revelation of the Holy Scriptures was given. It says that even the words used in the giving of the Bible, not just the ideas, but the precise terminology, all the words, were planned by the Holy Spirit, who deployed the respective authors of the Bible books to write comparing spiritual things with spiritual, literally matching spiritual words to spiritual ideas. This biblical view of the Bible's derivation is called the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures, meaning every word is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word breathed. Hallelujah. And I encourage us all, and that's me included, we absolutely need to develop a regimen of reading and hearing God's word daily. It is detrimental. If you're not reading it every day, do it. Just do it. Me included. Do it. Let's this day make a decision that we are going to take time out of every single day. Set a time, either early in the morning, late at night before you go to bed, um, listen to it in your car, on your way to work, or wherever you go. Whatever time you come up with, get the word in you every day. It's detrimental. We need to be able to have discernment in these days. Just like the farmer who needed to rightly divide his field if he was going to have a crop, if his life was going to have fruit, that he and his family needed to survive, I implore you, read your Bible, study it, rightly divide it in order that you will survive in these days. God is clear when he says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. The Holy Spirit helps us to discern the word, as we know, Scripture tells us. And as we read the word and grow in it, that benefits us every day, as we are able to discern everything happening around us. The more word you have in it, the better able you are to discern everything. And all of the information that's being thrown at us, as, we, as well as making decisions on a daily. We make decisions all day long. The more we operate in spiritual discernment, full of God's word, the more successful our lives will be. Spiritual discernment protects us. It guides us. It informs us. It helps us, and it enlightens us. Let's look at Ephesians 1, starting with verse 15. Ephesians 1.15 says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, 
that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Hallelujah. This spirit of wisdom and revelation that verse 17 talks about is in addition to what we receive at our conversion. It's more than just having the Holy Spirit. It's, it's just the start when we're filled with the Spirit. It suggests that there is even more knowledge, more wisdom, <clears throat> greater insight. And in fact, we'll never stop learning. There's more than enough for us throughout our whole lifetime. Oh, the depths and the heights and the truth of God's word. How exciting it is. How exciting it is. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. When we spend time diligently, rightly dividing the word with a hunger and a thirst for the truth, which is a deliberate action on our part to find out what scripture says and means and how to apply it daily, discernment is found in that. It is a natural outcome. When we make every effort to draw close to him and his word, naturally we have discernment because it's inside of us. It's written on our hearts. And in the helps for that scripture, it says, when the wealth of his investment in you is understood. Let's actually read what it says there in the helps for 118. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened literally means that your heart may receive the brightness of hope, resulting when the wealth of God's investment in you is understood. Hallelujah. When the wealth of his investment of, in you is understood. That understanding of the wealth of his investment, what he did on the cross for you, this book that he, he breathed for, out for you, when that's all understood, it naturally makes us hunger and thirst for more. When we really understand the investment that he put into each one of us. Hallelujah. We want more. We want more. I want to know more. I want your truth more. I want more wisdom. I want a spirit of revelation, a spirit of knowledge. More and more and more. The Passion Translation for these scriptures says, for verse 17, I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through your deepening intimacy with him. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So he's praying that, that they would have more, that the, the Lord Jesus Christ would impart more which is the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation to know him through our deepening intimacy with him. I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritances that he finds in us, his holy ones. Wow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I heard somewhere, read somewhere, just that someone said, discernment is not optional for the believer. It is required. It's absolutely necessary. Like I said, in these days, than ever before. This is life or death. Life or death. Holy Spirit discernment is life or death today. Not only are we bombarded with information, that information war, which includes lies, evil narratives, uh, wrong agendas, all kinds of things, but we're also pressured by our current culture to agree with the lies, the doctrine. We, and if we don't, then we're labeled all kinds of things. The Christians who stand with the word of God and what God says about all the moral questions of our current society are currently under attack for our belief in the Word of God and what His Word says about all of those things. And many cave under that pressure and compromise the truth of God's Word, which for us as believers is absolute, as we talked about. This is the absolute truth. 
The word of God is the whole truth. It's nothing but the truth. So help us, God. It was God-breathed, as we read. There's no gray areas. He created the universe. He created everything in it. He created truth. He is true. And I, for one, am not going to, under any circumstance, bow to anything less than what God says about a sub any particular subject or matter that anybody says to me or anything I hear. No matter what the popular culture dictates and no matter what kind of pressure society and culture puts on me. Robin Bullock said something this week. Again, I just kind of caught glimpses of things as Pastor Jeremy was listening to some things and I was studying. And I quickly wrote it down. I just, whoop, you know, you catch that word. You're like, oh, that was good. And this is what he said. Maybe some of you have heard this before. Maybe it's a common phrase, but it sounded good. The truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. Simple. The truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. God is love. The word is love. Every part of his word emanates love. He loves us so much. He loves us so much he sent his only begotten son. He loves us so much that he wants us to prosper, to have perfect peace and joy and success. And the only way to do that is to adhere to, to apply the word of God to our lives. That's how we prosper. And he knows it. That's why he gave it to us. This is our guidebook for a prosperous, successful, joy-filled, peace-filled, perfect life. Right here. Right here. And he knows that. And he loves us so much. This is love. This is love. And he wants it for every single person. And guess what? So do we. We want it for every person. All those who don't have it, we want this for them. And that's why we love them. We don't hate people as the world tells us we hate people if we're adhering to the word of God. Just the opposite. Amen. Just the opposite. We see people making wrong decisions in their, and living certain lifestyles that we know are contrary to his word and are killing them. And it's stealing from them and it's robbing their true identity from them. And, and, and we walk in love toward them because we want God's best for them. Every person, we want them filled with it because we're filled with the truth. We're filled with his word. We're filled with love. And we want to see people set free and saved. So we abound towards them in love. We want to see people prosper and walking in joy. We see what the enemy has done to kill, to steal, and destroy. We see God, uh, we see, we see this, the enemy stealing what God intended each person to be. Their identity. Who he created them to be. We see the confusion and the chaos that the enemy has perpetrated through all of the information and the propaganda and the lies and the deceit. Satan is a liar. He is deceiving people. And so many are caught in the trap of those lies. We don't hate them. We want to see them free. That's love. I'm going to look at Philippians 1, starting with verse 9. Philippians 1, 9 says, I'm going to read 9 and 10. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. The more we know, the more we love. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And just in my side notes there, I'm just going to mention that when it talks about offense... <coughs> Because we, we know that the truth, the word of God, is offensive to those who are perishing. But what it means here is that we're not a stumbling block for anybody. We don't cause somebody else to stumble. Instead, we encourage, we support, we uplift, we speak the truth to them. How many of you here have heard of Ray Comfort? Does that name sound familiar to you, Ray Comfort? He has a, a video, a YouTube channel. He's an evangelist who goes out on the streets and he makes videos of interviews that he has with just people that he meets on the streets. 
Uh, he has this narrative that he usually follows, and it centers around why we need Jesus, why we need a Savior. He usually begins by asking them if they believe in God. You know, he talks about wonders, what their beliefs are. And he, then he begins to explain why, kind of unravels in this really intellectual, really smart way, that God is real and why we need him, why every single person needs him. And it's very methodical, and it's always just so interesting to watch people start to think about their own existence and their own theology and their own opinions and ideas about the world around them. And it's, it's, it's interesting to watch that evolution take place. A lot of times, he ends up leading people through the salvation prayer at the, at the end. I just watched one recently of a young man who, who was in tears at the end. Just like, I need God, crying, and, and prayed the prayer of salvation. It's, it's, it's fun to watch it. Last week I was watching an interview. It wasn't him, but I assume it's someone on his team because it was the same YouTube channel as his, so it obviously was somebody on his team, and similar style of questioning. This particular evangelist began questioning people on their beliefs and thoughts about those top issues of our times. Like, when is it okay to kill a baby in a, in a person's, in a woman's womb? And what is a woman? So he was asking all of these questions to these there's three sets of, of people. And as he questioned them, it struck me how similar their answers were as the video jumped back and forth between the three separate interviews. It was like they were adhering to some narrative that they've been hearing over and over and over again. And they were all repeating the same thing. But when it got right down to it, as he challenged their answers and pressed in with common sense and biblical truth, their answers began to break down as they kind of grasped for straws to explain the basis for their opinions and their ideas, and which ultimately didn't hold up as there was no foundation. It appeared that they had been just haphazardly following this narrative that's so popular that we've all been inundated with about what we should say and how we should respond so as not to appear intolerant or judgmental without really looking objectively, logically, or consequentially at our opinions. Mm -hmm. It struck me as I listened to their answers just how strongly they would stick to them, even when challenged with common sense. And as the questions dove deeper into their reasoning and why they thought the way they did, their answers got more and more off kilter. They made no common sense, no sense at all, no substance. It reminded me of Ephesians 5, 6. Let's turn there. Ephesians is just a book over, so it's not too hard to go there. I'm going to start at 6. I'm going to read through 16. Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Verse 6 again says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. And that's just what those evil narratives are. They are empty words. There's no truth. There's no substance. There's no foundation in them. The prevailing idea behind this way of thinking is that there is no absolute truth. Everyone has their own truth. In fact, that was one of the lines that they kept saying. I kept hearing one after one. Well, everybody has their own truth. Whatever your truth is, okay, that's okay for you, that's okay for you, that's okay for you. That is, no make no bones about it, that is man elevating self above God. Amen. Amen. It's elevating personal opinions, feelings, 
ideas above his truth, the word of God. God's word is the final authority and on all matters pertaining to life and godliness. I'm going to look at 2 Peter 1, starting with verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I'm going to look over at the truth in action section at the end of 2 Peter in the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. I'm going to read a little bit of that in the Cultivating Dynamic Devotion number 2. The book of 2 Peter warns against false teachers and false doctrines. Two primary ways we are to fortify ourselves against such deception are to know Jesus and to know the Bible. Knowing the truth and recognizing the authentic will help equip us to recognize the false. Did you catch that? Knowing the truth and recognizing what is authentic helps equip, equip us to recognize the false. It is imperative then that we make our relationship with the Lord our highest priority. Begin reading and studying the Bible. Spend time with the Lord. Talk with Him. Share your heart with Him and get to know Him intimately. He loves you and longs to spend time with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And over on the next page, it says, Strengthen your devotional life by reading and studying the Bible until it becomes a part of who you are. Part of the way you think, the way you talk, and the way you act. Yes. Thank you, Lord. As we know, Christians can be deceived. We know that. As many are. My, my people perish. My people, that's Christians. That's God's people. The enemy has been around for thousands of years studying humans. He is not all-knowing like God, but he has learned some things about us. I just brought up the big topics in society, but what about the more subtle, cunning, tricky, sneaky ways that the enemy tries to throw us off track? Remember, he comes as an angel of light. We may have tendencies toward certain opinions or ideas. Our emotions may be leaning in a certain direction. The enemy can and does capitalize on that. We can't rightly divide the word or test the accuracy of something we hear if we allow our opinions, attitudes, emotions to cloud what God says about a matter. The only filter that we want is the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hebrews 4.12 from the, trash, the uh, Passion Translation says, For we have the living word of God which is full of energy, like a two-mouthed sword. It will even penetrate to the very core of our being, where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet. It interprets and reveals the true thoughts and motives of our hearts. The enemy brings lies and deceptions, half-truths, watered-down beliefs, ear-tickling messages, even through Christian teachers and ministers, a Christian program, a Christian song. Sometimes I have to skip a song on Pandora because I, it, it just doesn't bear witness with my spirit. Something they're saying in the song is just not quite right. It's a slippery, dangerous slope. And we need to arm ourselves with the truth. Lest we also fall into wrong doctrines. And long, wrong beliefs and somebody else's opinions or thoughts or ideas about the word of God. It's meant for our destruction. It's meant for the destruction of all humans. The enemy comes. He's the enemy of our soul. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Not just the world and the unsaved, but he takes great pleasure when he can take out a member of the church. 1 Corinthians 12.10. Let's look at that. Are you all still with me? Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, a little bit more. It's good. It's the word. Hallelujah. Where is 1 Corinthians? Oh my goodness. Okay. After Romans. Uh, 
I do know that. First Corinthians 12, 10. Starting with verse 10. Uh, I might go up a little bit further there. I'll start with verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. This is a list of gifts from the Holy Spirit. And you, you see in, in verse 9, discerning of spirits. Is, and in the helps it says it's the ability to discern the spirit world. And especially to detect the true sources of circumstances or motives of people. In the kingdom dynamics, it says these gifts are given when they are needed. We will be in tune with this gift when we are walking on a daily with God in his word, making him and his word a priority of our lives, keenly seeking him and his truth in every circumstance we face, every message we hear, every song we sing or listen to, every news program we might watch, any. A post on social media that we look at, any newspaper or magazine headline that we read, any leader we hear or person that we talk to, especially if you have a check. You all know what I mean by that, right? Yeah. You get a check. We hear, we hear it termed a check in our spirit. It's when we hear something and we're like, oh, I don't know about that. For me, sometimes it's a little bit of a gradual process. Uh, procession, and I might think, mm, I'm not sure about that. And then I'll dwell on it a little bit. I'll think about it, and then I'll bring it to God. You know, is what, what was in that? Was that what, what's that check that I'm getting? I'll bring it to the Word, and I'll, I might even look around at somebody's face that I trust. I remember looking at Pastor Diane's face all the time, just as you could tell the, by the expression on her face. And sometimes it's, it's like blatant and like, no, that's not true. I don't, I don't receive that. I, I heard that. That's not accurate. But it's when it's more a subtle check that we have to be more diligent to search the matter out. Because sometimes that check might be our own opinion or idea about something. It might actually be true. But I want to know. We want to know what is the truth in all of these situations and all these things. So let's turn to 1 John. 1 John 4. First John 4, 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have become overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And down in the house it says, That which fundamentally distinguishes the people of the world and the people of God is their respective attitudes toward Jesus Christ. By the illumination of the Holy Spirit, who is greater than Satan, who is the spirit of error, true believers may overcome deceiving teachers. We have to have discernment. We have to have this word in us, big time. This is a message, is an urgent warning for us all. Scripture is so clear. We have to operate in spiritual discernment. Scripture 
says, as I've mentioned already a couple of times, that if we don't, we will actually perish. Hosea 4.6 of the New King James Version says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Yikes! That's serious business. The truth in action for this scripture says, Pursue and value godly knowledge. Understand that what you do not know can hurt you. I don't want to be destroyed. Do you want to be destroyed? No. no. I think I just have one more scripture that we're going to turn to here. It is Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. Nope, I'm wrong. I'm not, I, it's not true. <laughs> I'm going to read that after. Okay. But I wrote it out. James. James 1, sorry, turn to James 1, 5 through 7. You know, guys, all know this one. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask who? God, who gives to all liberally. He gives it liberally. All we gotta do is ask him without reproach, and it will be given to him, to us. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Then it helps it says, A double-minded man is a person drawn in two opposite directions. His allegiance is divided and because of his lack of sincerity, he vacillates between belief and disbelief, sometimes thinking that God will help him and at other times giving up all hope in him. Such a person is unstable in all his ways, not only in his prayer life, the lack of consistency in his exercise of faith betrays his general character. Ephesians 4, 14 through 15 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. That's Ephesians 4, 14 and 15. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro. You mentioned the scripture this morning. And carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. In the ocean. Pastor Heidi and I had a discussion about the ocean last night. So she'll recognize this. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have at least seen the ocean, right? Even if on TV you've seen it. But if you've ever been in it, you are familiar with how strong the waves can be. The force of nature, a force so strong it'll, it'll knock the strongest man in the universe off his feet and carry him away. Utterly helpless to the power of the waves. A ship is easily tossed up against the rocks, if not what? If not anchored. Hebrews 6, 18 through 19, the Passion Translation says, So it is impossible for God to lie. For we know that his promise and his vow will never change. And now we have run into his heart to hide ourselves in his faithfulness. This is where we find his strength and comfort. For he empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time. An unshakable hope. We have this hope, this certain hope, like a strong, unbreakable anchor. Holding our souls to God himself. Our anchor of hope is fastened to the mercy seat in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but rooted and grounded and anchored in his word. As we mature in Christ, growing in our knowledge of him and his word, our discernment of good and evil is sharpened. It is literally an anchor, the strongest of anchor. Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But the solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Have their senses exercised like lifting weights. Discernment is a muscle that we have to exercise. How do we exercise it? Study the word of God in prayer, talking to God, worshiping God, gathering with the saints. 
Upright living. Draw close to God. Draw close to God. Draw close to God. And he'll draw close to you. I'm going to close with this scripture. I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation, Romans 12, 2. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. I want to live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in God's eyes. And I don't want to be destroyed for lack of knowledge. I don't want you to be destroyed for lack of knowledge. I don't want any person to be destroyed. Discernment is a weapon. We need it. It's a weapon of our warfare, especially in these end times. Get it. Get discernment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I thank you and praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for your discernment, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit leading and guiding us in discernment. I thank you and praise you, Lord, for helping us to diligently, to be diligent in the word of God, to hear your word, to know your word, to study your word, to test it and prove it, to rightly divide it every single day. Give us, empower us to do that well, Lord. Give us the tools that we need to do that well. I thank you and praise you, Lord, for that unction, that, that unction, that wooing that you're doing in, in us, in each one of our spirits, that we would focus on you and your word in all of this information that's going around us. We filter it through your word, in your word only. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for this day, that as we go about our day, Lord, we will continually be reminded of you and who you are and whose we are in you. Not forsaking or not casually coming into your presence or an understanding, but just in awe of who you are. I thank you for that the fear of you is the beginning of our wisdom. Hallelujah. Thank you for this day, for your angels around us as we go our way. Safe travels to our homes and a blessed fruit-filled day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.